welcome to Millennium News Hour. I am Tanzeeba Nauri. In today's bulletin, we will present important news from across the nation and the world. Let's begin with the headlines of the day. Military police enforce driving ban in snow stricken Buffalo. A storm brings gusty winds, rain, and snow to California. Southwest under scrutiny after a wave of storm cancellations. Pennsylvania certifies election results after recount delay. Democrats to wield power when Minnesota legislature convenes. Lavrov says Ukraine must demilitarize or Russia will do it. South Korea military sorry for failing to down North's drones. China to scrap COVID-19 quarantine for incoming passengers. Japan to require COVID-19 tests for all visitors from China. Serbian army on alert as tensions rise in northern Kosovo. Spain scraps value-added tax on staple foods in aid package. Ten civilians killed in roadside bomb in Burkina Faso. Germany's governing coalition argues over COVID restrictions. UN says 26 Rohingya refugees died at sea, making perilous journey. Police say bus crashed into parked truck in Sudan, 16 killed. Cardinals J.J. Watt indicates he will retire at end of season. U.S. to let MLB stars play for Cuba in World Baseball Classic. Irving Durant lead Nets past Cavs for ninth straight win. And PSG stars Mbappe, Neymar fired up as French league resumes. Now news in detail. A storm battered Buffalo braced to a stay for fresh snow while still counting fatalities and striving to recover from the deadliest storm in western New York in at least two generations. Mayor Byron Brown's office announced seven additional storm-related deaths Tuesday, bringing Buffalo's total to 27, along with at least seven suburban fatalities. The toll surpasses that of the historic blizzard of 1977, blamed for killing as many as 29 people in a region known for harsh winter weather. The National Weather Service predicted that as much as two inches more snow could fall Tuesday in Erie County, which includes Buffalo. It is the second largest city in New York with about 275,000 residents, while Tuesday's forecast was nothing like the massive storm that dropped over four feet of snow in some places starting Friday. Any additional snowfall that Buffalo may continue to have is going to be impactful, said lead forecaster Bob Oravik. The rest of the United States also was reeling from the ferocious winter storm, with at least an additional two dozen deaths reported in other parts of the country, and power outages in communities from Maine to Washington state. On the Rosebud Sioux Tribes Reservation in South Dakota, there were plans to use snowmobiles Tuesday to reach residents after food boxes were delivered by helicopter and trucks over the weekend, the tribe said. In Buffalo, the dead were found in cars, homes, and snowbanks. 
Some died while shoveling snow. Others, when emergency crews could not respond in time to medical crisis. County executive Mark Polankers called the blizzard the worst storm probably in our lifetime, even for an area known for heavy snow. The winter blast stranded some people in cars for days, shuttered the city's airport, and left some residents shivering without heat. The first in a week of storms brought gust winds, rain, and snow to California on Tuesday, starting in the north and spreading southward. There were numerous reports of roadway flooding and downed trees and branches, the National Weather Service said. Winter storm warnings were issued for the Sierra Nevada, where motorists were advised that the combination of winds and snow could make travel hazardous. The Greater Lake Tahoe area and Mono County were warned to expect heavy snow with wind gusts around 50 mph and up to 100 mph along Sierra ridgetops. Lake Tahoe was expected to have waves that could capsize small vessels. Downtown San Francisco had received more than an inch of rain and Mount Tamalpais had more than four inches before dawn. The weather system, an atmospheric river spawned by a low pressure of the Pacific Northwest, was spreading slowly down the coast and was expected to reach Los Angeles by evening. Forecasters said California will experience unsettled weather through the week. Major U.S. airlines were broadsided by the massive weekend winter storm that swept across large swaths of the country but had largely recovered heading into Monday, except for one. Problems at Southwest Airlines appeared to snowball after the worst of the storm passed. It cancelled more than 70% of its flights Monday, more than 60% on Tuesday, and warned that it would operate just over a third of its usual schedule in the days ahead to allow crews to get back to where they needed to be. American, United, Delta and JetBlue suffered cancellations rates of between none and 2% by Tuesday. The disparity has triggered a closer look at Southwest operations by the U.S. Department of Transportation, which called the rate of cancellation disproportionate and unacceptable, and sought to ensure that the Dallas carrier was sticking by its obligations to stranded customers. The size and severity of the storm created havoc for airlines. Airports were overwhelmed by intense snowfall and drifts. Airlines cancelled as many as 20% of their flights Saturday and Sunday and Buffalo Negra International Airport, close to the epicenter of the storm, remains closed Tuesday. Pennsylvania's top elections official fully certified results from the November vote late last week after recount petitions in some counties had delayed the process, the Department of State said Tuesday. An agency spokesperson said Acting Secretary of State Lee Chapman completed certification of all races in the 2022 midterm election on Thursday. The final tally was issued less than two weeks before members of Congress and state lawmakers are due to be sworn in on January 3rd. The inauguration of the state's next governor, Democratic Attorney General Josh Shapiro, will be held January 17. Recount petitions in at least 27 of the state's 67 counties, covering 172 voting precincts, caused delays as some county elections boards waited until litigation was resolved before sending in their own certifications to the state. The Department of State had said it expected to comply with a request from the clerk of the U.S. House to send certification documents to Congress by mid-December. Conservatives voicing concerns about the accuracy and reliability of Pennsylvania's voting machines and procedures filed most of the petitions. The majority were dismissed, but county judges did authorize at least 19 percent recounts in six counties that moved vote totals barely or not at all. Democrats will control both the House and Senate for the first time in eight years when the Minnesota legislature convenes January 3rd, giving them power to decide how to use a $17.6 billion projected budget surplus and new opportunities to pass liberal initiatives that the outgoing Senate Republican majority had blocked. The main job of Minnesota's legislative stations in odd-numbered years is to set the budget for the next two years. 
The surplus theoretically makes that job easier. But Democrats will have to reach agreements among themselves on how much of it to spend, on what, and whether to return any of it to taxpayers. The Democratic majorities are just 70-64 in the House and 64-63 in the Senate, which could mean some tough, closed-door deal-making ahead. Democratic Governor Tim Walz is the third element of the party's political trifecta in the state. He has already said he would like to revive his 2022 proposal to give part of the surplus back via tax rebate checks. The governor will have more to say about his priorities when he releases his budget proposal January 24. Now it's time for global updates. Russia's foreign minister on Tuesday warned a new Ukraine that it must demilitarize, threatening further military action and falsely accusing Kiev and the West of fueling the war that started with Moscow's invasion. Sergei Lavrov said Ukraine must remove any military threat to Russia, otherwise the Russian army will solve the issue. His comments also reflected persistent, unfounded claims by the Kremlin that Ukraine and its Western allies were responsible for the 10-month war, which has killed tens of thousands of people and displaced millions. Russia launched the war on February 24, alleging a threat to its security and a plot to bring NATO to its doorstep. Lavrov reiterated on Tuesday that the West was feeding the war in Ukraine to weaken Russia and said that it depends on Kiev and Washington how long the conflict will last. As for the duration of the conflict, the ball is on the side of the Kiev regime and Washington that stands behind its back, Lavrov told the state TASS news agency. They may stop senseless resistance at any moment. In an apparent reaction, Ukrainian presidential advisor Mikhailo Podolyak tweeted that Russia needs to face the reality. South Korea's president on Tuesday called for stronger air defenses and high-tech stealth drones while the military apologized for failing to shoot down North Korean drones that crossed the border for the first time in five years. South Korea's military scrambled warplanes and attack helicopters on Monday, but they failed to bring down any of the North Korean drones that flew back home or disappeared from South Korean rudders. It raised serious questions about South Korea's air defense network at a time when tensions remain high over North Korea's turret run of missile tests this year. On Tuesday, the military again launched fighter jets and attack helicopters after spotting suspicious flight paths at a frontline area. A local county office sent emergency text messages notifying residents of a new batch of North Korean drones, but the military later said it was a flock of birds. China will drop a COVID-19 quarantine requirement for passengers arriving from abroad starting January 8. The National Health Commission announced Monday in the latest easing of the country's once strict virus control measures. Currently, arriving passengers must quarantine for five days at a hotel, followed by three days at home. That is down from as much as three weeks in the past. The scrapping of the quarantine requirement is a major step toward fully reopening travel with the rest of the world, which the government severely curtailed in a bid to keep the virus out. The restrictions have prevented most Chinese from traveling abroad, limited face-to-face -face diplomatic exchanges, and sharply reduced the number of foreigners in China for work and study. China's Health Commission said that steps would be taken to make it easier for some foreigners to enter the country though it didn't include tourists. It did indicate that Chinese would be gradually allowed to travel abroad for tourism again, an important source of revenue for hotels and related businesses in many countries. People coming to China will still need a negative virus test 48 hours before departure, and passengers will be required to wear protective masks on board, an online post from the Health Commission said. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida announced Tuesday that Japan will tighten border controls for COVID-19 by requiring tests for all visitors from China starting Friday as a temporary emergency measure against the surging infections there. 
The announcement comes days after the World Health Organization said it was very concerned about rising reports of severe cases across China after the country largely abandoned its zero-COVID policy. The quantitative antigen test that is already conducted on entrants suspected of having COVID-19 will be mandatory for all people arriving from mainland China. Those who test positive will be quarantined for seven days at designated facilities and their samples will be used for genome analysis. The measure begins Friday, just as Japan heads into New Year's holidays marked by parties and travel, when infections are expected to rise. Last week, India also mandated a COVID-19 test for travelers from China, Japan, Hong Kong, South Korea and Thailand, while ordering quarantine for those with symptoms or testing positive. India has also begun randomly testing 2% of international passengers arriving at airports. Protesting Serbs in the ethnically divided city of Mitrovica in northern Kosovo erected new barricades on Tuesday, hours after Serbia said it had put its army on the highest combat alert following weeks of escalating tensions between Belgrade and Pristina. Serbia's defense ministry said in a statement late on Monday that in response to the latest events in the region and its belief that Kosovo was preparing to attack Serbs and forcefully remove the barricades, President Alexander Vucic had ordered Serbia's army and police to be put on the highest alert. Since December 10, Serbs in northern Kosovo have erected multiple roadblocks in and around Metrovisa and exchanged fire with police after the arrest of a former Serb policeman for allegedly assaulting serving police officers during a previous protest. Around 50,000 Serbs live in the northern part of Albanian majority Kosovo and refuse to recognize the Pristina government or the state. They see Belgrade as their capital and are backed by Serbia, from which Kosovo declared independence in 2008. Spain on Tuesday announced a new series of measures including scrapping valued added tax on staple food such as bread and milk and is extending rent and eviction controls to help ease the economic crisis caused by Russia's war in Ukraine. Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez announced the measures in an end-of-year speech. The government said it would also cut VAT on cooking oil and pasta from 10% to 5%. Fish and meat products were excluded from the tax reductions. Sanchez said the three packages of eight measures passed since the start of the war in February would cost about 45 billion euros, including 10 billion for the latest round of measures. He said the aim was to protect the middle and working classes given the rise in the cost of living, energy and food. Although inflation and energy prices in Spain have fallen sharply in recent months, many Spaniards continue to suffer severely from a crisis that started with the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020 and was exacerbated by the war. Ten people were killed and several injured when their bus hit a roadside bomb in eastern Burkina Faso, the government said Monday. The passenger minibus was traveling near the village of Bugui on Sunday afternoon when it hit a mine, Colonel Hubert Yamiogo said in a statement. The injured were taken to the hospital in Fada and Gorma, the main town in the east, and the rest of the passengers on the bus disappeared. Yamego said, the government is restoring security to the area and trying to locate the missing passengers. Violence linked to Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State group has wrecked the country for more than six years, killing thousands and displacing nearly two million people. The government's inability to stem the attacks led to two coups this year, with each junta leader vowing to make security a priority. However, attacks are continuing and swaths of land are being cut off by jihadis. The East and the Sahel regions have been some of the hardest hit parts of the country, with towns becoming besieged by jihadis who prevent civilians from moving freely. Germany's governing coalition is arguing over whether remaining COVID-19 restrictions should be dropped after one of the country's top virologists was quoted as saying that the pandemic is over. Germany has scrapped the bulk of restrictions imposed at the height of the pandemic, but unlike other European countries, it still requires mask wearing on long-distance trains and buses. Masks are also mandatory in doctors' practices, while masks and negative tests are still required to enter hospitals and nursing homes. 
rules for local transport are a matter for Germany's 16 state governments and some have dropped mask mandates. Some also have scrapped rules requiring infected people to isolate at home. Comments by Christian Drosten, a professor of virology at Berlin's Charity Hospital, to the daily Tejas Pijel's Tuesday edition prompted a renewed argument over whether the remaining rules are justified. At least 26 Rohingya Muslims had died in dire conditions during a month at open sea while making a dangerous voyage that brought scores of others to safety in Indonesia. A UN agency said Tuesday, adding there will likely be more. Exhausted women and children were among 185 people who disembarked from a rickety wooden boat on Monday in a coastal village in Aceh's PD district, authorities said. A distressing video circulated widely on social media showed the Rohingya worn out and emaciated with many crying for help. They are very weak because of dehydration and exhaustion after weeks at sea, said local police chief Fauzi, who goes by a single name. The UN High Commissioner for Refugees said that survivors told the agency that 26 people died during the long journey. A passenger bus slammed into a parked truck on a highway in the Sudanese city of Omdurman early on Tuesday, killing at least 16 people, police said. The bus swept off the road and hit a parked truck in Omdurman, the twin city of the capital, Khartoum, according to a police statement. At least 19 people were injured in the accident, police said. The bus was heading to Khartoum for Fasher, the provincial capital, North Darfur province, police said. Ambulances rushed to the scene to transfer the injured to the Omdurman hospital, while the dead were taken to the morgue. There was no immediate word as to what caused the bus to swerve. Traffic accidents are common in Sudan, often the result of badly maintained roads and poor enforcement of traffic laws. Thousands of people are killed every year in road accidents in the impoverished African country. Now it's time for business news. Now a look of today's sports stories. Even though he is still playing great football, it looks as if defensive lineman J.J. Watt is ready to call it a career. The three-time AP Defensive Player of the Year indicated Tuesday that he will retire at the end of the season posting pictures of his wife and family on social media while leaving the message was first ever NFL game, my last ever NFL home game. My heart is filled with nothing but love and gratitude. It's been an absolute honor and a pleasure. 
The 33-year-old Watt was among the premier defensive players in the NFL during the early 2010s with the Houston Texans. The former Wisconsin standout was a first-round pick in 2011 and was dominant from 2012 to 2015, finishing that four-year stretch with 69 sacks to earn all three of his AP Defensive Player of the Year awards. The United States will permit Major League Baseball players from Cuba to represent their home country in the World Baseball Classic next year. The decision announced Saturday in a news release by the Baseball Federation of Cuba could be a big step in once again turning Cuba's national team into heavy hitters on an international stage. Major League Baseball confirmed Monday that the U.S. granted the license to FCB. It clears the way for MLB stars such as Jose Abreu, Jordan Alvarez, Randy Arizarena, Joan Moncada and Luis Robert to play for Cuba in the WBC in March if they choose to accept a potential invitation. It's up to each country's national governing body to pick the players on its WBC team. Final 30-man rosters are due February 7 for the WBC, which begins March 8 with Cuba facing the Netherlands in Taiwan. Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant each scored 32 points and the Nets extended their longest winning streak since moving to Brooklyn to nine games with a 125-117 victory over the Cleveland Cavaliers on Monday night. The Nets withstood a sensational 46-point performance by Darius Garland, who single-handedly kept the Cavs close in the fourth. Brooklyn has won 13 of 14 and is beginning to look like an NBA title contender. T.G. Warren added a season-high 23 points for the Nets, who handled one of the teams they are chasing in the Eastern Conference standings after beating Milwaukee by 18 last Friday. Paris Saint-Germain stars Kylian Mbappe and Neymar could take out their World Cup frustrations on a struggling Strasbourg when the French league resumes on Wednesday. Coach Christophe Galtier said Tuesday that both players are ready for league leader PSG's match at Parc des Princes, even though Mbappe has had little time off since France lost a Wild World Cup final to Argentina in Qatar on December 18. Mbappe became only the second player to score a hat-trick in the final, but was inconsolable after Les Blues lost on penalties to Lionel Messi's Argentina following a 3-3 draw. Still, Mbappe returned to training with PSG just three days later. Let's have a look on today's weather forecast.
That's all in today's news. Keep watching Millennium News 24 for latest updates. Millennium TV USA and Millennium News 24 network is transmitted and available to be watched free for all at TVs such as Sony, Samsung, LG, Roku TV, Amazon TV and Apple TV. And also in all European countries and Australia available with Sky Network, Worldwide Jago TV, Radiant IPTV, Worldwide Jago BD Network and Horizon Satellite globally. Stay connected with us for all types of informative and entertainment program. Thank you.